Dear sisters and brothers, I welcome you all to contemplate the last seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. Now we are before God to remember and celebrate the crucifixion of Christ, his son. The Bible says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his unique son so that everyone who believes in him might not be lost, but have eternal life. Jesus Christ died on the cross to redeem humankind, to restore the broken earth, and to save humankind from their sins. The first reading is taken from Isaiah 52. See my servant shall prosper, he shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. So that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, 
and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he was borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. As we, like sheep, have gone astray, and have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. But a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I shall allot him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Here ends the lesson. Psalm 22 My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime but you do not hear and in the night season and I'm not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm. I know man, a reproach for men, and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out their lip, they shake their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Praise the Lord. A reading from Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 16. This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, 
having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. After they had eaten the supper, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom you are looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus, since the disciple was known to the high priest. He went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciple and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crawled. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. 
It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to Jewish leaders again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have your custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face, Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to tell you now that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the stone pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabada. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription 
written and put on the cross, it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the, then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. The Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And this is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of high soup and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you may also believe his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Give thanks to the Lord for his glorious gospel. Praise to Christ our Lord. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Many that day, of course, knew exactly what they were doing. The temple priests, fearing a popular uprising, had plotted to get rid of him. Better one man die than the people perish, they had argued. Those who had tried earlier to make him king abandoned him when he hadn't turned out to be what they wanted or expected. So at Golgotha they jeered, Hail, King of the Jews! Why don't you come down? We'll believe you then. Cue gales of laughter. As for the Roman contingent, it was simply Job done, let's toss for his clothing. Jesus, in agony, prays, Father, 
forgave them. Of course he did. How else, he had taught, could evil be overcome? But Jesus' cry goes deeper than that, much deeper. As his life ebbs away from the very depths of his soul, his cry echoes down through the ages. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's a cry of the very deepest love and utter despair. Love for humanity and despair at humanity's continuing failure to use its capacity for enlightenment and wisdom. Think, he'd always urged. Think about what the commandments really mean. And in parable after parable, he'd challenged them about what it was to be fully human, about how people can best live together in society. Love your neighbour as yourself is the foundation of the law he had taught. But such radicalism, insisting on treating everyone as a neighbour to be loved, shocked the rich and the powerful. So they set about silencing him by having him nailed to the cross. His vision of how people can live together cooperatively and peacefully wasn't for them. Why? It would touch their pockets. They would lose their power. It was unthinkable. Little has changed. Humanity still doesn't use its capacity for enlightenment and wisdom. Inequalities abound. Conspiracy theories pollute thinking. All threatening our life together, threatening the planet itself. So Jesus' agonized cry, they don't know what they are doing, haunts us still. It's a cry urging us to stop, to begin to listen to the Holy Spirit, to God within. The future of humanity and of our ability to survive on the planet depends on us responding to that agonized cry by working together to achieve real clarity of understanding of how we all need to change. We really do need to know what we are doing before it's too late. As we reflect on the seven last words of Christ, may we spare a moment and think of the two thieves whose crosses were placed slightly apart to that of Jesus. This meeting God kept for such a time that even a sinner close to death could reach out and be saved. What beautiful words Jesus spoke giving hope to the thief who sought forgiveness. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Flashing before my eyes, I see my life, recalling all the things I've done. And I look down at those faces, hatred is all around. Why, oh why did I waste my life? What joy have I ever known? Can I ever be forgiven? from all of those whom I have wronged. Oh, when will he cease his cursing, declaring how innocent he was? Nobody owed him a living. It was his choice to do good or bad. We took the road together that took us deeper into a life of sin. And now we are paying for it on these crosses as darkness closes in. Crucify him, crucify him, with the shouts that filled the air. Voices cried out mockingly, Why don't you come down from there? Who is this man, I wonder? Have I ever seen him before? So I turn my head to look at him, and my heart begins to soar. No words do I speak aloud, but in my heart I cry, Why, this man is innocent. Who has sent him here to die? I've heard of this Jesus, People flock from far and near. They listen as he preaches. The kingdom of heaven is near. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
other words, I hear him say. My heart cries out silently, seeking forgiveness as my life slowly ebbs away. Jesus turns his head and looks at me with such love that flows my way. And I hear his voice saying, truly I say that you will be in paradise with me today. Two thieves crucified stand side by side with Jesus. One full of repentance, the other could only curse. But when a heart cries out seeking forgiveness, God is there listening intently. All heaven rejoices when a sinner repents. Such reassuring words Jesus gave to that repentant thief that day. And he is still saying the same to you and to me. People today need to hear the Easter story and understand how much Jesus loves them. There will come a day when we close our eyes and say goodbye to this world and awaken in paradise with our beloved Saviour, Jesus. So, when asked how much did Jesus love me, stand up straight, throw your arms out open wide and say this much. The seeking heart will see the cross as we lead them to the feet of Jesus. I turn my head and see this repentant sinner looking at me. He cries out, have mercy on me, Lord, a sinner that I be. When you come into your kingdom, is there a place set aside for me? My heart overflows with such love as into eternity he steps with me. Amen. As part of our Good Friday service, I've been asked to speak on the short five-word line, Woman, this is your son. I've taken the slight liberty of putting this into context a bit by reading you a short part of the text before and after this line. This is from chapter 19 of St. John's Gospel. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved, that's Peter of course, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time, the disciple took her into his own home. In this brief reflection, I think we can look at what we can learn from this about Jesus and his mother, their relationship, that of them both with Peter, and what this tells us about our own faith and ourselves. John's Gospel is a bit different from the other three. It's sometimes described as being rather theological. Mark's Gospel, for example, tells us in pretty accessible language what Jesus did and said. It's an easier read than John, who whilst also telling us what happened, almost always brings in another dimension. There are more subtle points about our faith, the point of each story and of Christ's teaching for both ourselves and our beliefs, also for the church going forward. There's a lot of metaphor. It's almost allegorical in parts. Things mean more than we at first think. We know Jesus has given Peter the role of being the rock upon whom the church will be built after his death. Jesus says this clearly. Mary is seen by the majority of Christians as being the mother of not only Jesus, for which task she was specially chosen by God, but also as a mother of the church. The great majority of Christian teaching on this subject, so-called Mariology, agrees that this is the case. So with Mary and Peter in these roles, we can see, in theological terms, the symbolism of this line. Woman, here is your son and its significance for the Christian church. Jesus in his time on earth was of course both human and divine. The Son of God, one with God to put it another way, but on earth definitely human too. So did he feel pain when he was scourged and whipped by the Roman guards? This on behalf of all of us. Of course he did in the most terrible way, the same as the other wretched prisoners who were tortured and crucified, 
in that time of Roman rule in Palestine. So with his essential humanity in mind, I like to think that a part of this quote, woman, here is your son, is really also on a human level. Jesus is dying. He knows he is. He's concerned for his mother, for his mum in these human terms, making sure she'll be cared for by the man he loves and trusts most. We go on to be told that from that time onwards, Peter took her into his home. But I just want to finish by looking a little deeper at another aspect of this. I heard a story on Radio 4 last week about a family whose child had died of COVID-19 last year. One comment made about their grief was that when the child died, the mother felt a part of her had died too. I'm sure we can all understand that. Mary stands with us today at the foot of the cross watching her son die. She must have shared in that death. A large part of her must have died too. In spite of that, or is it because of that, her special role, her special calling, continues for us and Christians now as a mother of our church. We told earlier in St. John's Gospel that when a seed falls on the ground, it must die before it can grow again and bear fruit. So for us to fully partake in Christ, for us to bear fruit, we have to, in a sense, die first not literally in our earthly lives, but to give ourselves up to Jesus, to be born again, as we read in Scripture. For some, this is a single experience, a moment of revelation, following which their old life dies, and they suddenly know Jesus. For many others, and I'm one of these, it's a lifelong struggle to put those things that are not good behind us, to let part of us die, to enable us, bit by bit, to continually receive new life in Christ. So I'm asking us to reflect on these five simple words, Woman, here is your son. To consider this in terms of the theology, the understanding of, a, of the faith of our church and ourselves. To further consider the essential humanity of Jesus in his time on this earth. And finally, perhaps, to think of how we, like Mary I'm sure did, need in one sense to die to be able to fully partake of Christ in our lives. As we now contemplate what today, Good Friday, means to us, may we perhaps reflect on these things. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus hangs on the cross and he feels weighed down. He's feeling the pressure, the weight of what the prophet Isaiah had said centuries before. Isaiah 53, we read, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And Jesus, feeling the isolation of a scapegoat, finds the breath to utter these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Words of Jesus from the cross, familiar, but they are also a direct quote from the beginning of Psalm 22. Words of desolation, but if, like Jesus, we know the rest of that psalm, then these words are balanced by other words, words and declarations about God, the God who listens to the cry for help of those who are afflicted. When I was a minister in Lincolnshire, I officiated at the wedding of a young Christian couple who went on to have a daughter. And tragically, when their daughter was three years old, she was killed by a falling structure at a garden centre near to where we lived. I was involved in the funeral service and this grieving young father and mother cried out to God, echoing those words of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words from Psalm 22. And yet that service, that funeral service, was infused with praise and worship, modern worship songs and hymns, which that couple had chosen, 
which were about trusting God, and it almost seemed like an act of defiant worship. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet I will praise you. And sometimes in our Christian lives, we will have times when we ask the same question that Jesus asks from Psalm 22. God, why have you abandoned me? We may feel like that. It may appear to be the case. But, but we need to hold on to those other words of affirmation and comfort and trust and hope. And perhaps Jesus said these words from the cross, feeling on a human level like we all do from time to time, like God has turned his back on us. He's not interested in us. He's not close to us. But I think that Jesus, having known for a long time what his mission was, what his destiny was, that he also believed on another level on the cross, those other words from Psalm 22. For God has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. And for those times when we feel the need to cry out these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus did. Let's take comfort in the knowledge that Jesus felt like that too. And also that such feelings are mitigated and balanced for us by facts about God's goodness and loving kindness that the word of God declares and that we too can experience. I am thirsty. The last word spoken by Christ on the cross. Crucifixion, the very word, sends a shudder through me. Pilate did not want to be involved and had Jesus flogged and scourged to appease the priests and locals. This was often sufficient to kill a man anyway. Jesus was then mocked and had a crown of thorns pressed into his head. That was not enough. And the crowds shouted, crucify. Jesus was then crucified and his hands and feet nailed to the cross. This would be a special treatment as metal spikes would be expensive. I suspect the robbers on either side of Jesus would simply be roped to the cross. After three hours or so, everyone, including the Roman soldiers, wanted to go home. But they had to make sure the prisoners were dead or crippled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. The soldier wetted a sponge with some sour wine and put it to Jesus' lips on the end of a stick. No doubt. This would soothe his cracked and broken lips just a little. And shortly after that, Jesus died. The Roman shoulder pierced his side with a spear to make sure he was dead. He was then given over to his followers. This was the greatest man who ever lived, the Son of God. He tries to get us to live in his likeness, he does this with no violence, only spiritual inspiration. We are so fortunate to know what spirituality really is. We must help young people to know Jesus so that they can choose to follow him. It always worried me that some people who are never exposed to Jesus, would never know what Christianity meant. Are we thirsty? Thirsty for God? Jesus yearns to be with his Father. A spiritual thirst. And a, a line from one of the Psalms, as a deer longs for flowing streams, 
My soul longs for you, God. It is finished. John 19, verse 30. To understand this fully, we need to look at verses 29 and 30 in full of John chapter 19. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The sixth of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. It is traditionally known as the word of triumph, being the announcement of the end of the earthly life of Jesus in readiness for the resurrection. In his book, Final Words from the Cross, Adam Hamilton, American pastor and theologian, wrote this, these last words are seen as a cry of victory, not of dereliction. Jesus had now completed what he had come to do. A plan was fulfilled. A salvation was made possible. A love shown. He had taken our place. He had demonstrated both humanity's brokenness and God's love. He had offered himself fully to God as a sacrifice on behalf of humanity. As he died, it was finished. With these words, the noblest person who had ever walked the face of this planet, God in the flesh, breathed his last. John's Gospel is the only one to use these words, which are sometimes translated as it is consummated, or the debt is paid in full. Both Mark's Gospel, in chapter 15, verse 37, and Matthew's Gospel in chapter 27, verse 50, say, he cried out with a loud voice and gave up the Spirit. These few words, it is finished, are for me crucial in indicating that at that point the slate is wiped clean for humanity and we have a fresh start, a new opportunity. And each time Holy Week comes around again, it is time for us to review what we have done to help the progress of the fulfilment of the Kingdom of God on earth. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. The time has come, the end is near. The stage is set, darkness enfolds the land. The curtain of the temple is torn asunder. Jesus utters these words, into thy hands I commend my spirit. These moments symbolically touch the whole world from the bounds of the secular, the darkness, to the innermost sanctuary of the holy, the torn curtain. His mission and ministry to place humanity visibly and permanently into an enduring closeness with the divine draws to a close. No more can people say, show us God, for in Jesus we have seen God. We have seen the love that asks no questions, that does not count the cost. But equally, we have seen what humanity is capable of, the good, the bad, and the ugly 
of humanity for all to see. In the face of some terrible catastrophe, people ask, why could God not stop this? In Elie Wiesel's much applauded account of the Holocaust, entitled appropriately, Night, he describes the last days of an old Polish rabbi, Ariba Druma. In the midst of the chaos of those being treated like cattle, he asks, where is God's mercy? Where is God? How can I believe? How can anyone believe in this God of mercy? But Weissel counters, if only he could have kept his faith in God, if only he could have considered this suffering a divine test. But as soon as he felt the first chinks in his faith, he lost all incentive to fight and opened the door to death. The answer the New Testament offers is precisely this moment of the cross. As St. Paul recognized, for Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God does not control the mechanics of this world like some mystical or powerful puppeteer but stands with us in our suffering. In these few words, into thy hands I commend my spirit, he places his life, his ministry, and his mission into the hands of the God who first set him off on this journey. But it is not a dedication to some distant deity, but the one who is his father, in the deepest and most intimate way, the one whom he taught his disciples to call our Father. I wonder if in those moments his thoughts went back to his childhood, when he talked with the scribes and teachers in the temple, and later responded to his mother, Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? His story was, and is, about his father's business. And it is still there, as in these dying moments, he says, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Today our intercessions are drawn from a Good Friday prayer from the Iona community. Lord God, we meet beneath your cross today, separated in social distancing, together in love. We meet as friends, strangers, mourners, grieving for the loss of love in the world. We meet because we want to understand the awful things that happened. We meet because we want to be with you, alongside you on the cross. And in our meeting, we keep silence. We keep silence in a time when words fail us. We keep silence as you kept silence on the cross. And so we keep silence with those crucified today and with those who live in darkness, in hopelessness, in pain. We keep silence with those treated as today's scapegoats, foreign workers, jobless and homeless people, refugees, people of colour, all who don't fit in. We keep silence with those robbed of a sense of belonging in our society, robbed of esteem, 
of earning power, of childhood, of parenthood, of innocence, and of their pre-COVID self. We keep silence with those whose lives are being extinguished by corrupt governments, by religious and ethnic intolerance, caught in the crossfire of other disputes, in famine and natural disaster. We keep silence with all who mourn in these COVID days the death of a loved one, the death of a patient lovingly nursed, the loss of togetherness at the point of death. And from around the world, the countless millions who mourn day after day We keep silence with those who suffer in silence, who are afraid and ashamed to report abuse, who are unable to open up to a listening ear, are imprisoned in guilt, not knowing God's forgiveness. We keep silence for ourselves, for those deep concerns of our own hearts and for the well-being of our nearest and dearest. In pain, misfortune, oppression and death of the people, God is silent. God is silent on the cross, in the crucified. In this silence is God's word, God's cry. In solidarity, God speaks the language of love. Amen. Let's go.